Good day everyone, Doc Mika here and this is the first part of module 8 wherein we will discuss the alimentary system or surgeries, procedures that we usually do for this body system in large animals. Right? Since I have received a request and I deemed this um, part of um, the course necessary you know if i'm going to summarize or i'm going to make the syllabus more concise equine dentistry is still a big part of large animal surgery since it is um if not the most common one of the most common procedures or fields that um are specialized in or um the most common procedure done in uh, horses, all right. A um, big, a uh, big focus on the oral cavity and the dentistry in horses, um, if not more than their musculoskeletal system, is because when a horse stops to eat, or if something happens in its oral cavity, which uh, will induce pain to the animal. The effect of anorexia in horses are very drastic as compared to other animal species. A small dehydration, uh, diarrhea, not eating can render your horse um, very far apart from other well-performing uh, horses. This is why a lot of procedures right, in equine dentistry are routine procedures um, and not therapeutic or diagnostic in nature right they are routine and preventative basically they're more preventative in nature all right let's begin with of course the anatomy the dental anatomy of horses are quite similar to other hypsodont um, tooth animals all right um, brief dental formula the other part the other uh, the picture on the left is the modified triadent system or the, de the dental numbering system for horses all right so it's um, color coded in there from the incisors the canine if present uh premolars and molars all right so the, briefly the dental formula would be uh three three for the incisors uh canines can be absent or not all right they could be present and they usually only appear in males uh premolars would be three to four on the maxillary uh, teeth and three for the mandibular cheek teeth and uh, three molars basically six molars uh, for the maxillary and six molars for the mandibular all right how they're numbered how they're assigned is outlined on the picture on the left all right so i've said they are of a hypsodont dentition these are high crowned teeth right an animal extending past the gum line as compared to dogs and cats or some omnivores right herbivores need an efficient or uh, an efficient and continually growing caps right for efficient grinding and this hypsodont the classification of dentition is the same for most herbivores right ruminants um damn i forgot <laughs> Yeah, elks, deers, horses, giraffes, um, and so on and so forth, all right? The arrangement or, uh, yeah, the arrangement and alignment of um, the dental anatomy in horses is described as an anisognathous fashion, right? What does it mean? It means that uh, this is a caudal view of the oral cavity of the animal, emphasizing that the maxillary quadrants, meaning yung mga ipin sa maxilla, the upper part, uh, that would be triadents ones and uh, twos, right, are wider than the mandibular quadrants, which you could appreciate in this image on the right, right? Mas malapad yung nasa maxillary than the mandibular. And as you can see, the occlusal surface, okay, I hope you still remember the surfaces of the teeth, right? Let's try all right, uh, you have um, at for the cheek teeth, okay, for the molars, premolars, you would have a four 
uh, surfaces. You would have the occlusal surface. Yan yung occlusion. Yan yung nagiging in contact with the occlusal surface of the other um, part or of the upper and the lower. All right. You have the lingual surface, meaning that is in contact with the tongue. You have the buccal surface right here, which is in contact with the gums. All right. And for the incisors, that will extend to the front part of the incisors, which is in contact with the lips. All right. Uh, what else? Oh, um, this part here. Okay. This is lingual surface for the mandibular uh, cheek teeth. All right. These sides. However, when you go to the maxillary teeth, this is not the lingual surface anymore. This is the palatal surface because it is in contact with the hard and soft palates. Right? Now, Doc, bakit slanted? Why? Bakit hindi na lang pantay? It was said that um, this fashion or this arrangement of the teeth um, and alignment would lead to effective grinding. And um, given that their diet is most uh, mostly leafy, you know, soft, leafy, uh, hay, forages, um, they need effective grinding. Right? Um, they do not, horses do not have the same uh, digestive uh, system of ruminants wherein they can efficiently, right, they can efficiently uh, grind those uh, foodstuffs and then regurgitate it back if it needs be. Right? Horses are monogastrics, so the oral cavity is very much involved in effective grinding of these um, foodstuffs. Right? Uh, however, this uh, arrangement would predispose the formation of sharp edges on this part right here, meaning the lingual aspect of the mandibular cheek teeth and the buccal aspect of the maxillary cheek teeth, right? Because yan yung kumbaga that will uh, sharpen or that will continue to grow if the occlusion or if the way that the horses chew is not utilizing the entire occlusal surface of the entire dental arcade right this is why uh the the most common procedure done routinely in horses is floating okay uh, indications of course uh we always start uh, before we identify that this horse needs floating, this horse needs a dental extraction or exodontia, um, it needs a dental exam. Okay, We always start with that so that we will be able to identify what the horse needs. Right. So our, the routine horse health management um, is once a year. It becomes more routine once they reach five years old. Because um, review on your, um, what do you call this? The time that each, um, how you age, how you determine the age of horses based on the teeth. You're be, uh, basically relying on the eruption of the teeth, right? And once all the permanent teeth have erupted, has replaced all the deciduous teeth, uh, the routine management uh, for the teeth of the horses is once a year. Now, for some certain disciplines or performances, performance horses, if they're involved in dressage, for example, it is twice a year by um, the guidelines of that competition, right? Now, it, uh, in horses uh, which were diagnosed with dental problems, uh, were, um, how do you call this, have a predisposition or had a history of uh, maxillary sinus abscesses, dental extractions, infections, diastema. Um, diastema is uh, the separation of the teeth. Okay, you may gap in between um, uh, two pieces of teeth. Right, that's diastema. Um, if horses have more, you know, more spaces. Sorry. Um, kung hindi lang isa yung gap sa mga teeth niya, kung yung mga teeth niya ay hiwa-hiwalay, that's what you call diastemata. Alright? So, that um, precludes your horses to have a dental exam more than uh, once a year, right? Usually two to three times a year, at least, depending on the condition. So, what else? If you notice a mandibular or maxillary swelling, uh, draining tracts, alright? Yan yung mga subcutaneous or uh, sorry, uh, skin 
um, they look like puncture wounds, but there's fluid coming out of it. And you would think, right, by the pathology of a lot of these dental problems that an uh, infection um, originating from the oral cavity formed the fistula for the drainage of the wound and the, the pus and other discharges on that uh, infection. And they found a hole or they formed a hole into either the mandibular area, the ventral mandibular area, or sometimes even the ventrolateral area, right? Um, depends on the teeth that is infected, right? Unilateral nasal discharge, remember, the nasal cavity and the oral cavity are only separated by uh, the palate, right? In horses, um, the because the teeth are so long, right? It actually connects to the nasal sinus. This is why some of the oral, sorry, uh, oral infections, like uh, teeth infections, uh, forms abscesses and leads to either a nasal, uh, a swelling on the nasal area or on the mandibular area, right? And sometimes it would find a drain again through the nasal cavity. Ipsilateral lymphadenitis is, is um, quite a very common indication of an infection. And if it's not, you know, uh, what they call this, a uh, pantay, kung yung isang, for example, the left or the right lung, right? You could already narrow it down. What side of the oral cavity could possibly have an infection, right? Difficulty in eating or chewing can be seen. Um, by a number of uh, clinical signs or manifestations. Uh, slow mastication, usually in normal masticatory uh, movements ng horse, you would hear crunching sounds because the grinding is so efficient. You could hear the grass being um, chewed, right? However, if there is a problem there, there is restricted mandibular movements, restricted masticatory movements of the muscles, specifically the masseter and some of the hyoideous muscles under the, man, uh, the mandible. Um, ma babawasan yung efficiency ng horse to chew, right? Abnor abnormal uh, mandibular movements, if there is, um, what they call this, favoring of one side over the other. For example, um, it should be equal, like this uh, GIF <laughs> um, is showing. See, it chews uh, from the right and then it chews on the left, right? Pantayan. But if you observe the horse um, just chewing on one side, which uh, honestly, I um, when I had my, it's not a wisdom tooth. I think it was a second, thir uh, second molar. Yeah. Uh, after I got uh, orthodontic surgery done for that, I can only chew on one side, right? And you will see that uh, common manifestation in horses as well if they have a problem with their teeth, right? Quitting, qui uh, quitting, quitting, I don't know how it's pronounced. I know how it's spelled though, quitting. Uh, it, this is dropping of partly chewed food stuff from the mouth, right? Pag may nahuhulog. Um, Again, horses have a long, uh, elongated oral cavity. So there is a very big surface area for them to uh, chew and not drop anything, right? So that's one sign as well. And of course, oral pain, right? And that, is, that can be assessed through uh, light palpation, lang, right? Now, what do we need for a dental exam? Um, the materials, right? Uh, they call it the materials that we usually need would be sedatives, right? Uh, the usual sedatives that we can um, use would be young accessible satin, alpha two agonists, uh, salazin, and usually combined with uh, butorphanol, right? Uh, that is described in a lot of literature. Headlight, because again, you uh, the oral cavity is so long. So you might be able to see the incisors really well. You will be able to see the occlusal surfaces of um, the, the rostral teeth very well, but you would have a hard time to visualize the caudal teeth, right? That's why you need a headlight. You will need these uh, dental mirrors. If you, uh, if you visited the dentist, you would see they use these mirrors to visualize the surfaces of your tooth. And um, this is just a long, you know, uh, uh, an elongated version of the dental mirror. Oral speculum um, that could, uh, some, for some in horses, 
that is also what you call the probe wherein you could assess the depth of the the periodontal space to see if the periodontal ligament is still good and the oral endoscope or oroscope as i have uh, researched oroscope uh, can be used like an in the image on the center you could see that basically it has a camera on the end and you could be able to connect it to a screen and see all right dahil mahirap nga makita yon if you're just using your eyes and your headlight all right now the first uh, part of your uh, we'll, we'll discuss this in a bit you will only sedate up to a certain point a part of your dental exam must be done before sedation all right now what makes dental exam quite challenging right challenging for equine practitioners even for clinicians you know you could see that the commissure commissure the lip all right the amount of space all right or yung ability ng horse to open its mouth has a very limited distance right as compared to us as compared to a brachycephalic dog as compared to a cat right you're only limited by this um space right here that's why it's quite hard number two when your patient when the horse is in pain right when the horse is in pain um it would tend to move its head a lot right it would not let you do that that is why a certain part of your exam is done before you sedate and then you sedate all right uh what else what, what why is it quite uh, challenging for horses, uh, for us to examine horses, hmm? what can you think? You know, uh, you, uh, I'll leave that question for you to to ponder about. You don't need to, to send me your answers for that, but um, expect that maybe to be a bonus question in the exam. You know, why is it hard? Um, uh, I've given you an example that this part here is very small. All right, the demeanor of the horse is also a very big factor. What else? All right, now. Um, we always start the dental examination with the external examination of the head, right? This must be done before sedating the patient, right? What you can first do, right? Again, your examination, you don't need to even touch the horse yet, right? Same thing with other animal species. Usually, you first observe. And the thing that you could do is you could offer food, to the horse and evaluate how it chews, right? You check for quitting. You check if it favors the left or the right side. Um, you listen for any absence of the vigorous crunching sounds, right? Number two, you evaluate the head symmetry, right? You look at the animal from the uh, cranial uh, view, right? And check if my abnormal swelling ba. Meron bang hindi pantay? right the the animal will um would not have its leg pawing on its face but sometimes if it's in pain they would also rub their face on a post uh rub it on a tree bark you know they would very be uh, uneasy right um you check for any bone or soft tissue swelling you have to identify what specific part of the head um has this swelling all right um, you check for any protrusions or twisting of the upper and lower jaw. Meron ba siyang underbite? Meron ba siyang overbite? Right? What are the medical terms for that? You know, the other, the other terms for that. You palpate, of course. Now, this is the time where in you try to, uh, to touch the patient. And you also have to be careful. Horses bite. <laughs> right? And when they bite <laughs> again they don't have that canine uh you know the, the matalas part it's a uh, what they call this a flat set of teeth <laughs> so when they bite they just suddenly yeah, mm. i think that's more painful than than a tooth were in you could see how it could puncture your skin imagine if it's just you know flat like two sets of plywoods just smashing on your arm okay so be very careful when you do that um, again, if your patient is very aggressive, it's quite, uh, you cannot handle it. Wag mong ipilit na mag uh, offeran ko mo kita mo na ng food, you know, for me to assess. Kung inaatake ka na at binahan ng sisipa, and the only way for you to do that is to sedate, right? And you could understand the side of the the horse 
Wherein it's in pain, it's thinking you're gonna induce more pain to the animal because you're gonna start touching it. Of course, it's gonna fight back, right? So, um, again, assess your patient before you actually do anything or even approach or touch the animal, right? Uh, what else? You assess for any displaced or missing cheek teeth. Um, the what do you call this? The buccal or the gums. Okay, the cheek area of the horse is quite thin. All right, there's a very thin uh, layer of muscle there, and you could actually palpate for the teeth inside, right? And if there's a missing cheek teeth, you could actually um, feel for it because there's a gap, all right? You um, assess the incisors for any food pocketing, a tooth overgrowth, which is quite common for the incisors to happen, for, uh, for the incisors for it to be observed. Right? And after you have done that you know, in a very docile animal, then you could sedate. Right? Now, we start with uh, the incisors. Right? The incisors are mainly used for age determination in horses. I have attached um, a PDF file or a supplementary material for you to be, and for me as well, to be reminded as to how we can determine the age of the horses um, uh, based on on the eruption of the teeth and the appearance of the occlusal surface of the teeth. Ano ba yung infundibulum? Ano ba yung dental star? Ano yung cup? Ano yung enamel ring? What does it look like? What is uh, What structure will you see at around three years of age? What structure will you not see after five years of age? Right? So, uh, what do you call this? Um, brush uh, review on that. All right? Uh, routine dental work on the incisors, if they're pretty much normal, is not commonly done, right? Um, but um, some cases wherein they need attention is when um, they're, they underwent trauma. The, the horse bit into something really hard, um, uh, something hit it in front of its um, face, you know? Um, it got, for example, uh, racehorses na lang, right? When they... When they uh, uh, fall down in a racetrack, right, and hit their head quite hard. Some of these incisors, since they're in the, the, mo uh, the most rustral area, would be impacted by the damage, right? So that's why it's the first uh, part that you check, right? But mostly, ang problema sa incisors would be either trauma-induced or there would be retained deciduous incisors right here. Or supernumerary teeth, may extra siya, which needs extraction, right? Uh, another thing that you need to check for the incisors would be the occlusion, right? This is um, a horse with a lateral deviation of the maxilla, right? And you could see that that interferes with the normal occlusion of the dental arcade, right? And then you have to figure out how you are going to fix that so that the upper dental arcade and the lower dental arcade will be in contact with each other for the horse to be able to eat, right? Plus, you check for overbite and, and or underbite. Um, I, I've said that already. Check for the occlusal surface, the, the we call this, if there's a visualization of pulp, right? I remember, the horse uh, horse's teeth continually grows, right? So there is a nervous and vascular supply all through the front, right? You would have the cup right here, uh, the ina. Oh, sorry, I should have. Hold. I'll try. <laughs> oh, this is just arrow. <laughs> Shunga. Sorry. I, I I wanted to show you um the structures here. You have the cup in the center. You have the enamel ring, the white line around the cup, right? You would have the dental star, right? And these parts, since these are yung nasa lateral, uh, sorry, these are the corner incisors that you have, which are usually in wear. Usually, yan ang pinaka in contact when, uh, with even grinding and grasping um, for uh, uh, the food. Remember, uh, these ones, right, they can chomp on the, f on the food with these. However, uh, most commonly, horses would use their tongue or their lips to, uh, as a prehensile organ for, uh, for food. All right, so usually ang in wear lang would be the corner incisors. All right, and the lack of the dental star there means that they are in wear. All right, what else? Um, account for any missing supernumerary or retained deciduous incisors, as you can see right here. All right, the 
the middle, sorry, yeah, the second um, incisor is being pushed rosterly by this. So you have to identify what you need to remove and what you need to retain. All right. Check for any mobility. It's very easy to be done. However, again, <laughs> be careful as your uh, as the the patient kind of bites. Okay. A check for draining tracts, calculus, very common. Check for diastemata between incisors, right? Check for gaps. You do not want gaps to be there. Why? Food, mainly grass, can get into those and cause decay, all right? Uh, what else? And the incisor hooks, right? In the video that I showed you earlier about um, when they floated um, the incisor hook, right? This is when the upper corner incisor and the lower corner incisor are not in contact that well, right? So this part here continually grows dahil hindi siya nagiging in contact with its counterpart below, right? This also happens when your uh, patient has a shorter maxillary arcade or a longer mandibular arcade kasi yung area na to wala siyang ka-in contact sa baba, right? space kasi hindi sila magkapantay. So you have to adjust that, right? Um, wolf teeth, canines, um, they usually emerge between 5 to 12 months of age, all right? Um, they are not involved in occlusion, all right? See, they're not even, you know, in contact with each other. They're not used as a prehensile organ because you have the lips and the tongue of the horse to get food, all right? So, um, they're just usually uh, removed routinely as uh, in performance horses because in performance hor horses, you need to place the bit, right? These are the restraint uh, equipment for the head. So that in, uh, interferes with how you place the bit and that causes soft tissue swelling um, because the bit, it's supposed to move really, you know, here without much, uh, what do you call this? Um, hindi siya masyado pinapansin a horse, you know, especially if horses are, are used to being placed with a bit uh, since a young age. Um, so, kailangan alisin yung canine or wolf teeth for these animals, right? In non-performance horses though, they can be left alone, right? Now, uh, once you're done with this, now you can place your oral speculum, right? Um, your, your patient is, is sedated already, okay? Uh, this will keep the mouth open. For your horse and for you to examine the rest of the dental arcade and since your horses are you know eating still <laughs> all the time you need to flush or clean the area um you could use uh, some actually just uses a hose and then my too big na lumalabas doon. some would use a large dosing syringe wherein you usually you know get the drenching syringe but these are big, big, big syringes. You could use simply water or you could uh, use 0.1% chlorhexidine solution. Um, sa small animals, because chlorhexidine solution is, uh, is the best thing for surgical prep. And that's pink. However, in what I see in horses, it's kind of blue. Right? Uh, maybe it's the brand that I saw. But what they use is, is color blue. Hmm. I don't know, <laughs> right? Um, flushing would enable you to remove any food stuff retained in the oral cavity and maximize your visualization. Now, you would know if there's still, uh, if you did your flushing really well and there's still food, uh, pieces of grass stuck in certain parts of the teeth, could be in between teeth, it could be on the occlusal surface of the teeth, then you have to check why these food stuffs, these leaves or these grass, um, are being retained in the food cavity because that can cause problems for your patient. All right, now let's start with the cheek teeth. Cheek teeth, I'm not gonna go into what one, two, three, four, five <laughs> is, all right? Okay, the, the infundibule, the, um, the pulp horns, all right? I'm not gonna go into that because I had a hard time reviewing that myself. <laughs> I just I, I don't have any energy to translate the entire thing. You could uh, I I attach a supplementary material for that, and I hope you're gonna look into it. Um, but it's a it's quite what do you call this? It's a memorization thing. You have to remember how many pulp horns are in every in every tooth, and that would differ for the maxillary sorry for the maxillary 
teeth and the mandibular teeth. It's basically, kailangan nila mag-match, right? You have a 109 and a 409, that should match. 110 and 410, that should match, okay? The occlusal surfaces of the maxillary tooth should match with the mandibular tooth. If not, then you need to float, right? You need to see why they're not in contact because your patient will have a hard time chewing and effectively grinding its food if just one of these would mess up its surface, right? The surface could be too deep. There's a way to know that. Um, there could be overwear or underwear of the, of the teeth. Then you have to check that too, right? Basically, um, dapat may kita mo dyan would be the pulp horns, right? And sometimes, right, when that is too deep or nagkakaroon ng, we call it basketball, mismatch, right? Mismatch. Um, the food can be retained in these areas, right? So you have to check. Um, the pulp horns and the infundibuli, are they too deep? How deep? Is the periodontal ligament still intact? Right? So you have to check that. Um, not gonna expect it to, to memorize these. Like for example, the third molar would have eight. Um, we call this uh, pulp horns. Right? Uh, not really. I'm not, I'm, not gonna, <laughs> I'm not gonna ask you that. Right? Uh, what's important with this one would be also the occlusal table angle. Okay? This is again a caudal view, all right? You will not be able to see this this way. <laughs> this is it's a caudal view, right? Unless the horse is dead and you're looking at the back of the head, <laughs> right? Um, if you're in a you're in the rostral view, kaharap mo yung horse. This is basically a ten to fifteen, um, what do you call this? Ten to fifteen degree angle, right? And that is maintained, okay? For uh, when you do your floating you're not gonna flatten it, right? Because that's the common misconception. When you're floating, you're flattening it. No, you're maintaining that table angle. You are filing any um, excess uh, teeth here, you know, the, the sharp edges here or sharp edges here to maintain that normal table angle. All right, um, I've said this, enchantment of, or food of forage on the teeth's occlusal surfaces. Um, if there's uh, food stuck in between the teeth that could be a possible diastemata this could be seen right here right you need to remove those with dental probes just imagine your periodontal probe pero mas mahaba and mas malaki um and of course also uh food staining right because uh, the grass would have its own um what they call that a uh, color it's not the term that i'm looking for pigment Pigment, right? And that is uh, sometimes if it get, if it gets stuck um, so long on the teeth's uh, occlusal surface, then that will actually look more greenish than this yellowish white color, right? These are the enamel points that I have been talking about. If they're not floated, they're not filed, that can be in contact with the soft tissue or the gums right here, and that could cause ulcerations, which can induce pain to your animal and lead it to not eat, all right? That is your indication for dental floating. Dental floating, okay? Uh, what do you call this? Um, technically, it's easily, it's easily done, all right? It can be done manually. It's basically, it's just filing, all right? It's just filing. Um, I have attached because it's so, uh, what do you call this? If you wanted to know the the details of it, right? Because it's too long, okay? And I won't be able to discuss extractions, which is what I want to focus on for this lecture, rather than floating, right? Um, I've attached like two, two materials and one video for floating for you to see how it's done, what are the instruments for it, um, and then you could um, do a summary of that and that's what you review for the exam but i hope that you would try to understand how it happens how they maintain the angle because they have a certain these is a series of um these oh, sorry these are the series of hand maneuvers how they move their hands which is pretty cool when you read it so i've attached it right there it's basically a floating manual right and also why it's called the float 
right? So I, I hope you, um, there's a video which is a lecture about floating, which I have attached as well, because I want to keep this lecture uh, less than one hour because I'm recording it late again. Uh, um, I'm very tardy. <laughs> I'm lazy right now, so um, I've just attached a video for it. It's quite a short video. It's it's very good. So just watch that for the dental floating. And then if you want to read more on it, then I have at attached the manual itself for floating. Right? Dental extractions or exodon. Exodon. Yeah, I am not sure. Um, there are a lot of indications why you would remove a tooth. Right? Have I seen this done? I have observed it but i was just manning the the hose for the wash <laughs> because there's a lot of people around the horse you, you, know, you want to see but again you can't see it because the the oral the oral cavity nandun yung kamay nung iko nung professor nung doctor right and it's adjusting everything inside and then kung ano anong instruments ang inaabot sa kanya ng intern so all i could do is man the hose which has the chlorhexidine <laughs> right as a as a as a clinician which was fun in itself nung nakita ko na yung ipin, but you know, I didn't really know how it happened. He just said it's magic, but mm. oh well. There's a lot of uh, reasons why uh, we would want to remove a tooth, all right? Retained deciduous teeth would of course require uh, removal. Periodontal disease, secondary to either gaps uh, in between tooth or diastema, dental maleruptions or displacements, right? As you can see right here, supernumerary teeth or malocclusions. Um, yes, that would require dental extractions as well. Um, endodontic disease, basically disease of the tooth itself or apical infection, which could be associated with um, osteomyelitis, either on the maxilla or the mandible. Right? Uh, paranasal sinus disease, secondary to oral or dental disease, uh, developmental dental disorders, oral or skull bone fractures, which, uh, for example, it, uh, there's a fracture on uh, basically the part of the maxilla holding the alveolar sockets for these um, teeth. Then if that bone is uh, weak in itself, uh, the tooth adjacent to that bone needs to be removed. Right? Uh, fractures are diseases of the dental crown or root, occlusal trauma, neoplasia, biting discomfort. Basically, the most common um, that I can say, according to the, the article as well, is the most common indication would be non-functional and infected teeth. Right? And that could be, you know, it could be because either of a PO disease, it could be uh, an abscess, you know, basically an infected teeth. All right now, uh, tooth removal or dental extraction should be uh, treated as a last resort after you try all the management methods to address a diseased tooth or dental related problems, and all of those uh, methods that you have tried have failed. Right? Um, you need to identify okay before you start to you know, equip yourself and start prepping for dental extraction. There are a lot of things you need to determine for you to be able to plan as, you know, a successful dental extraction uh, plan for your patient, right? You need to identify the specific tooth involved and if there is any involvement of the neighboring structures of that tooth. Right? You need to identify the dental disease process and the stage of it. Right? You need to also consider the age of the animal because the anatomy of the horse's teeth would vary depending on their age. Right? And um, the number of teeth right, that you were going to remove would also dictate uh, the surgical technique that you will employ and the number and how specialized your instruments will be, right? Now, um, extraction can be simple, right? Or it can be very time consuming. It will depend on the pathology that you're trying to treat, right? And it has a lot of uh, operative and post-operative complications if it's not done right. So you have to, again, always assess and evaluate your patient 
if it needs dental extraction or you could manage it right for now, now our goals for uh, exodontia would be number one of course would be to relieve pain right and if the other adjacent teeth are not involved in the disease process then you have to preserve them right that's why you're removing the infected tooth and of course you need to prevent the spread of infection either locally which is still a big problem for the horse because that area is uh, is involved in you know the digestive process and in maintaining the, the animal's nutrition right so you need to prevent the spread of infection there and systemically right now what are the basic principles of exodontia uh basically uh from from what my mind says is basically just two right it's just two right you loosen or you break the periodontal ligament that's one and number two you deform the alveolar socket you do those two things and then you will be able to remove the tooth again the first thing <laughs> i'll summarize all the principles it's just you you have to break or you have to loosen or you have to basically uh, yeah loosen the periodontal ligament which attaches the tooth to the gingiva and you have to deform the bone socket which is in contact with the tooth and the bone either the, man the mandible or the maxilla however there is still you know the the usual principles right you have to obtain adequate access to the periodontium again the your gums are attached to the tooth via the periodontal ligament you have to find a way to gain access through that right create an unimpeded unimpeded pathway for tooth removal right uh three use controlled force to elevate the tooth without damaging the adjacent structures right what makes uh equine dentistry quite challenging it's because you don't see you know you're relying on your knowledge of uh the anatomy of the dental arcade number one number two you're relying on your anatomy of the structures around the dental arcade which are is a very vascularized area you have the palatine artery you have the greater palatine artery then you have the mandibular artery at the, uh, the bottom right and nerves as well so you have to uh they call this you're imagining all these and then you're utilizing manual work of angling and maneuvering your hand inside that horse's mouth to be able to remove the tooth right we'll discuss the methods uh, in the next slide but basically it's that's why it's challenging you know all right uh, what else makes uh oral approach basically removing the tooth through the mouth right because there are two methods what uh, I, I think this should be on the other slide anyway hypsodon teeth have multiple roots of each tooth okay imagine this one is inside right and there is these uh there are these contours right in my grooves na yan, of the of the long part of the teeth inside the socket all you see is this part right here you have to remove the entire thing right this is why it's it's quite difficult and the most common complication is that they're not they're not able to remove the entire thing all right so that's what makes it challenging not impossible but challenging and you need to deform the dental sockets we which are you know which are in contact with the entire entirety of the tooth right now um two approaches in dental extractions number one is from the outside would be the transbuchal right or retrograde in some uh, literature right and the intraoral right basically that's the primary method of tooth removal now the earliest method to remove uh, diseased cheek teeth right was via the oral route right however however um yeah th that's how they do it you know the, the typical oral route they wouldn't think of you know approaching it from the sides however um when general inhalation anesthesia was invented and was um was used 
very very often and became like a standard in equine anesthesia it became hard to work inside a mouth when you have endotracheal tube maintaining gas anesthesia when you have um you call it, when you have a mask if you're maintaining a gas anesthesia so it became hard to do the intraoral that's why another method was discovered or was invented to uh, be able to remove uh, to, uh, the tooth while leaving the animal anesthetized and you have an endotracheal tube right there okay now um however uh they call this um they found right that this method was uh they call this um still has a lot of disadvantages and then when standing sedation was uh became the mainstay for anesthetizing animals uh, anesthetizing horses or large animals basically um bumalik sila sa intraoral because they found a way to um to operate again inside the mouth okay without the need for gas anesthesia because standing sedation now became uh in the forefront now now arrived in the forefront of anesthesia right so at uh, um does this happen anymore the transbuchal yes okay usually to address an existing um secondary condition wherein you need to operate through this right but usually it's a combination ngayon, right if you cannot reach it from the inside your first approach would always be an intraoral approach right what if you remove a fragment what if okay what if your patient does not have enough crown surface for you to grab for you to remove the tooth right so that's why you still uh, a lot of equine practitioners still use the transbuchal one in combination with the oral route right now advantages disadvantages every route would have its own what i'll be discussing in detail in this lecture would be the intraoral route right because the transbuchal is basically like a hammering work right you um in the transbuchal you make uh sorry you put a nerve block in there you palpate for the the tooth that you're that you're gonna operate on you make an incision and then you're gonna hammer it down basically you, you put a big nail or a steinman pin through the hole and then you're gonna push the tooth from the socket from the cheek down to the oral cavity then mahuhulog na lang siya right so basically that's just transbuchal but what i'm going to discuss uh, in here is the primary approach which is the intraoral right advantages um shorter healing time of the post operative socket which if you remember the picture earlier of how big the the tooth is under you know uh, that is hidden you know from sight right you would imagine that the socket would be so deep Right? But with the intraoral route, the healing time would still be shorter than transbuchal. Uh, less surgical and post-surgical complications, reduced time pressure, I guess, on surgeon and anesthetist, and the recovery risk for patient with standing sedation. Low risk of damage to adjacent structures, uh, reduced risk of, uh, for post-operative um, fistula formation. Let me go back to number four right minimal risk to adjacent structures what are the adjacent structures there tongue sure <laughs> what else what else is in the oral cavity or uh, adjacent to it okay on the head you have the facial nerve of course which has a lot of uh branching as we go rostral you have the parotid duct um the infraorbital nerve, which is running through that um, line right there. I said the palatine artery earlier, right? So these are just examples of that. Um, what else? Usually, uh, they call this, uh, there is less risk for post-operative fistula formation or like a tunneling, right? Basically, that's a tunnel or a drainage that the, um, that the fluids find or form for it to be drained. Right? But since the alveolus is still intact after extraction, you're not um, making an, uh, a hole through the bone right? because you're going to make a hole through the bone of the maxilla um, to hammer you know, through the transbuchal route. Right? But dito, since the alveolus is still intact, right? 
usually there's no um, fistula that happens. Disadvantages, there will always be disadvantages. Um, it can be very time consuming because it's kind of difficult. Right, depends on the difficulty. If you're, um, if the the tooth that you're trying to remove has a adequate crown, right, that you can grab, that you can manipulate, then it's fine. However, if this crown is damaged, right, may decay, nag break, punula, hollow, if it's hollow, and it's just full of hay inside, then it's quite hard. Right, you need special mouth restraint. Um, that the oral speculum you need for specialized dental instruments because with the transbuccal all you need is like a hammer you know it's like a osteotome a steinman pin you need an incision and local anesthetic in that area then bam <laughs> done <laughs> right but again more complications for that part right need for an intact exposed crown root confirmation and position see how deep that is right in in dogs it's quite easy <laughs> You know, you just use your dental elevator, you do some nudging, and that's it. Especially if the tooth is already uh, ready to go, right? With horses, even if your crown is very much damaged, the root can still be very much intact. So you have to find a way to loosen the periodontal ligament, which is wrapping around the entire root, right? This is one of the disadvantages. And of course, patient compliance. Your patient is only sedated, standing sedation, right? Meaning, um, it can still move its head, right? So you have to be careful when you place your dental instruments inside the oral cavity and then your horse is not well sedated, right? That can be prevented by proper anesthetic monitoring. Um, I will not be very much uh, focused on the dental instruments because um, they would depend on the size of the horse and basically the preference of the of the practitioner, right? But basically, uh, these are basic ones. You have the molar spreader, uh, molar extracting forceps. It could be three-pronged or four-pronged like right here, right? Dental elevators. This is a wolf teeth uh, remover. Basically, you're gonna do it the way, you know, in, in, um, in dogs or in cats. You're just gonna push through the, between the tooth and the gingiva and then try to manipulate it there. The probes. Right and dental putty, right? Dental putty, dental packing. Uh, basically, this is either a paste or a wax moldable uh, putty. P U T T Y. <laughs> yeah, putty, <laughs> right? Um, that they put on the socket, right, to protect it from contamination. Right? Again, because the the hole would be so deep, right? Um, that should uh. Um, not be contaminated by further food, okay? In most cases, in certain cases, which I'll discuss later, that's, uh, that's okay. You don't need to cover it, okay? Now, step-by-step -step procedure, this is like a, a normal <laughs> removal, all right? Um, imagination is the limit for this. Uh, there's a lot of videos earlier uh, with this post, but there's no video that actually shows you uh, what's happening inside as they're going through these uh, steps if you can find a video please uh yeah share it with your with your classmates but i can find one wherein they have a they have a camera inside the horse's mouth and as they're doing this so i'm basing it on pictures right so number uh number one the first thing that you need to do is you need to elevate the gingiva you need to separate the gingiva from the tooth on the lingual or palatal right and uh, buccal aspects, okay? So lateral and medial side, right? Separate it lang muna, okay? Um, the next one is the tooth to be extracted. For example, this one here uh, could be a O9, I think. Yeah, this is a mandibular. That's a, e either a 309 or a 409, right? Now, you need to separate it from the neighboring normal teeth. Right? Now, note, this has been noted in um, this article, uh, 06 and 11, all right? 11 and the sixth, okay? Tend to be loosened. Tend to be loosened. Tend to be uh, lumuluwang, right? When you want to extract 7 and 10, right? Dahil wala siyang ibang attachment, kundi yung 7, ay, sorry, yung seven at yung 10, 
right? So what you do if you need to remove the 7 and the 10, all right, is you spread or you make a space first between 7 and 8 and between 9 and 10, right? That's just... Uh, they they needed to point that out. Now, how do you spread? Remember the molar spreaders earlier? You're going to insert that there. All right. Right? You carefully place it between the teeth up to the gingival margins until you can't anymore. Okay? And then you close the handles. Right? To bring the blades partially together. You cannot place the blades inside there. Right? You can only place it on the sides muna. Right? But for you to spread, for you to separate it from the neighboring teeth, okay, basically you're going to, uh, yeah, I think you can imagine it. <laughs> okay? Yung blades niyan, nandun muna sa side. Wala pa yan sa gitna. Because again, your teeth are, need to be together. Remember? If not, there's a diastemata. Okay? And then you're gonna bring the, the handles together, which brings the blades together. Dun na sa gitna ng dalawang kipen. Right? You're gonna do that for the distal and the rostral aspect of the tooth. Right? Once more space opens, um, you adjust your spreader, you adjust your grip on the spreader uh, para mas mapalaki mo pa yung space. Right? Now, um, in certain uh, horses, uh, sorry, yeah, in certain conditions in horses, we're in yung crowns nung teeth na gusto mong tanggalin like for example this one see there's a crack right there right um see oh this is much clearer here and then hindi ganun enough yung crown um you can use either a dental elevators right or forceps instead okay and Im just imagine how far you're in <laughs> through there kaya ang mga um instruments ng equine practitioners ay mahahaba Right? And their control, you have to translate uh, that control that you have from the place that you're holding it on to, up to the distal end, which is in contact with the anatomical structure you're trying to manage. So a lot of uh, muscle uh, work here. Right? Um, you could also use a gingival elevator or osteotome. Right? Now, Extreme caution must be employed in manipulating the palatal side of the maxillary teeth because you have the palatine artery running through right there. All right? This procedure is bloody. Okay? The, the videos that you see, are, they have blood and that's normal. But you just have to be careful because that's an artery. That's a major um, blood loss that you're looking at. All right? Number seven, once you have enough crown to grasp, okay, na separate mo na siya from the distal tooth, from the rostral tooth, and from the gums right here, now you could use your extraction forceps, okay? This one is a two-pronged one. You could start with that, especially if the tooth is quite small. Uh, you could start with a four-pronged if it's a big uh, crown, right? And then you enforce a side-to-side -side motion, right? Um, uh, there is a video two slides away. <laughs> um, basically, you're moving the forceps side to side in a lateral to axial, from the lateral to the medial uh, aspect of the teeth in oscillating movement. Tuloy tuloy lang. Para kang, para mong iniikot yung uh, forceps. Right? This will cause the tooth to rotate on its long axis. Okay? And what are you trying, to, uh, what you are trying to do here is you want to loosen the periodontal ligament. The ligament is not elastic. Okay? It will break eventually. But you have to induce that pressure and sometimes, you know, this is the long part of the, the time-consuming part of the procedure. Okay? Because it's quite, uh, it depends on the tooth when it will loosen. Right? Now, uh, you do not need to enforce excessive force, right? Whatever force that you're inducing into, uh, into the crown, okay? You're not grabbing the root, you're grabbing the crown. Um, should not be forceful and should not be hasty, okay? Because you could damage that crown and yan lang yung panghawak mo dun sa, uh, dun sa ipin, right? So be very careful. And also, when you're you, uh, moving that side-to-side -side motion, be wary of how the horse reacts. Okay? If you need to add more sedation, if uh, another restrainer should need um, is needed to be placed, then do so. Right? Next, uh, how do you know that the tooth becomes mobile? 
right? You can observe a sucking sound um, if it's a maxillary tooth. Um, the appearance of frothing blood around the tooth margins is also a sign, right? So you need to check the progress of uh, the mobility of the tooth periodically um, by removing the forceps that you're using, the extraction forceps, and then you could digitally palpate, right? Gano na baka umuuga yung ipin, right? Now, in young animals, in young animals, they usually have shorter crowns, okay? Deciduous, uh, deciduous um, teeth would have shorter crowns because they don't need to eat that much um, as compared to adult, um, adult uh, aged horses, okay? And, but they have longer roots because it has yet to erupt. So, maximal movement of the crown is needed for you to have an effect on the root. Hindi yung pwedeng chill-chill lang. Alright? Walang epekto yun dun sa malalim na, na root. However, in old animals, we're in almost the entirety of its, um, of its uh, root has been exposed. The entire crown has been exposed. A uh, slight movement of the crown will also cause the same level of pressure of movement on the root. Right, so that's a that's why knowing the age of the animal is very important when you plan out your surgical technique. Okay, so just continue with this movement until the tooth is removed. Um, normal teeth, right? Uh, sa normal walang patho pathology na ipen. The alveolar plate, which is surrounding the the teeth itself, is quite thin. So when you do that lateral axial movement, it's quite easy to deform. Right? And when it deforms, you go into um, it now comes into the part of the mandible or even the maxilla, which is kind of spongy. Right? So easy. Kaya rin siya madugo. Right? That's the spongy part of the bone. However, um, in uh, so that's all you need to do. The lateral axial movement, then it's gonna... You're, you're, uh, eventually, that tooth will come loose. Right? However, with deceased teeth, when you have osteomyelitic uh, pathologic, pathologic processes happening, when you have a secondary conditions happening, the, the bone, the alveolar plate surrounding the, the teeth is sclerotic, meaning there's extra bone fragments being formed and being wrapped around the teeth, which makes it more difficult to extract. So this is why um, some of these diseased teeth, when you try to extract them from the intraoral route and you do your lateral axial movements, they crack, they break. Meaning, wala ka nang pangahawakan. Paano mo pa mahahatak? So that's why they form, in, from an intraoral um, technique, they uh, switch into a transbuccal one. Dahil wala ka nang hahatakin eh. Diba? Yung natira na bone fragment na hindi nag-crack, nasa loob ng gums, hindi mo yun makukuha. So what you, uh, they switch to a transbuccal one. They're just gonna push it out from the other side. If you can't pull it, Push it out from the other side, right? Now, this is why you have to check the extracted tooth if it was removed completely and that no root fragments are left in the socket. Okay, I think I have a, a video here, short, quite short video. All right, let's try to play.
basically maybe it has no sound all right facial swelling they did examination radiographs are taken which is a vital imaging diagnostic uh for equine dentistry Wash it with antiseptic solution. The horse is sedated already, has an oral speculum on. Let's try to find. Here's the probe. The big muscular thing there is the tongue, guys. <laughs> right? He assess the depth. Oh, that's uh, one question. What's the normal depth um, of that area? Periodontal pocket in horses. Okay? You could research on that. Right? We're doing a block. Here we go. Just wanted you to see the lateral axial movement. Here we go. Observe the movement. And that takes a while, you know. Yep, that can take some time. Marami na kinapagkwentohan, hindi pa rin removed. And there you go. Yep, there's decay right there. Occlusal surface is quite stained. Okay. Let's remove it. Okay. Uh, I have another video in a bit, but um, I hope you were able to see that movement. Right? There you go. Again, limited visualization, so your knowledge of what tooth you have to remove needs to be right. Okay, now um, you have after you have removed the tooth. This is an image of a tooth. This is the only crown surface that you see. Beyond that, that is hidden <laughs> under the gums. All right, um, closed in by the alveolar socket. So you have to check the pocket or yung butas na na form yung pinagmula nito. Okay? You could do it through, with your finger, with a dental mirror, or an oroscope. You may, um, actually, you, you have to, <laughs> you know, you have to um, uh, get post-op dental radiographs to make sure the correct tooth was removed and that no fragments are left in the socket. That you could also check for any fractures on the adjacent structure so that you could see if you have, you know, if you've done any damage, right? Okay, so this is an example of a uh, alveolar socket which is empty. It's good after um, removal of this tooth. However, this one has a fragment inside, and this one is actually a cementoma. Right? Cementoma. Google that. All right. Now, um, it's not always that there, uh, if there is a fragment remaining on this area, you need to remove it. Yes, actually, but there are some exceptions to the rule. Um, this is uh, these are enumerated by easily in 2012 journal. I'm not sure if he's in Cornell or in UC Davis. Hmm. But he published an article about um, intraoral dental extractions, right? If the root tips are under five millimeters in length, you could leave it there. There is no evidence of periapical pathology, meaning around this area, there's no pathology right there, which could be left by the root fragment and start another problem right there. And if you believe that your attempt to remove the remaining root fragment that was stuck in here will damage any adjacent structures. It could open the maxillary sinus or it can cause uncontrollable hemorrhage. So again, um, there are some exceptions to the rule, but, it, um, but the big surgical decision will be made by the practitioner, right? Now, what do we do with the open space? 
right? The open alveolus needs to be protected from oral contamination. And you could use a variety of compounds for that. You have the dental acrylic or dental putty, the dental base plate wax, uh, PVS. There's another one, PMMA, which is uh, metal acrylic. Yun, yun ang ending nun. <laughs> metal acrylic. Uh, polymethyl methacrylate, right? Um, basically, uh, some of these are also used on the hoof of the, of the patient. Like, same uh, active ingredient, but of different brands, of course. You have the hoof putty and the dental putty. Um, and what you do is you mold it. It's like wax. Uh, yeah, it's like wax. Um, and then you place it, okay, one-fourth of the length of the crown, right? Hindi yung buong yan ang, ang pupunuin mo ng dental body, right? You need to leave a space um, in the alveolar socket for blood clot to form, for that wound to heal. Again, your phases of uh, wound healing, uh, inflammation, debridement, repair, maturation. So uh, you have to leave a space for it for granulation tissue to form. And this usually forms a, um, within 5 to 10 days. Right? Now, um, if, using, uh, if using a hard setting material like dental acrylate, this is also used in spinal surgeries, um, you have to remove it 6 to 8 weeks post-extraction. Right? Why? Because it will push through. Because it's a hard setting material. Cemento, basically. You need to remove it after uh, a while because it will push through uh, the soft tissue, it will put pressure on the adjacent structures like the tooth here, the, the two tooth here, um, eight, yeah, eight and ten. Um, and that could cause displacement of your of the other teeth, right? So you need to remove it. Um, another, another application of the dental acrylic or other uh, dental putty would be for diastematas. Okay, yung gaps, kita nyo dyan. When you see gaps, you know, um, I've never seen patients, uh, equine patients, uh, have braces. It is being talked about, but I have not seen it. I have not seen an article about it. I know it's being talked about. Uh, I read it in a book before that you know, it's being explored. However, while you don't have braces yet to bridge gaps, you know, um, what they do is they place the putty, the dental acrylic, through the gaps, right? Para wala nang mas stuck na food dun sa gap na yon, para walang decay na mangyari or any, uh, it will not initiate any pathology. So that's what they do. They put an acrylic here um, on the gaps, okay? And that will do for now, okay? And that one you don't need to, to remove because it will remain there. It's not up to, you know, under the, the mandible or maxillary area, right? Now, exemption to the rule. I, I said earlier that there is an exemption to the rule about dental packing. Um, in older horses we're in, there is a very small alveolar socket. Okay? Hindi yan ganyan kalalim. Because almost the entire crown has erupted already. So when you remove it, the sockets are quite shallow. Okay? And they have found benefits of not packing that dental socket. But instead, let it be filled with um, soft leafy hay, yung grass, nakakainin niya. And that will uh, basically form, <laughs> I call this, um, that will be the cushion that it needs. And it will not cause that much uh, like contamination or infection because the sockets are so shallow. They're not in contact with the, the spongy area of the mandible anymore or the maxilla anymore, right? Now, this is a video of, of the of removing a tooth through the intraoral route and then transitioning to uh, transbuccal route, right? Although in this case it's the 10. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Screw extraction on that. I thought it might be like that, so it's probably in fundibular disease. Is that all the way through everything? Mm, no. No, I need to go as 10 as many. No, it's quite confidentiality with the whole fist colour, is that? Is there any way to go wrong? Very. Although so in this case it's 10. <laughs>
in this case it's the ten. <laughs> Say that. Just help get. I might be able to do it. <coughs> okay. Through extraction on that. Thought it might be like that. So it's probably infundibular disease. That is the infundibulum. You can see the crescent shape of the yeah, infundibulum at the bottom right. there. Yeah. So. Just go in there, go to it. Yeah, they're removing one ten. So, right <laughs> upper arcade. <laughs> You just sorry. I'm just against bone there now. Whereabouts in the in direction. Can you just just against bone there now? I know. So there's a two good moving at all. Oh yeah, it's it's rotated and turned. Yeah. And oh, we got it. There we go. <coughs> that is pretty much all just apical cementoma.
yes, you could um, infiltrate. All right, that is it for uh, equine dentistry. I know I posted this quite late. So, um, yeah, we're going into, I believe, uh, alimentary system for ruminants, you know, um, mercipalizations, uh, ruminotomies by next week. Sunday na nga pala. Uh, next week. <laughs> again, I will be delayed again in doing that. But, um, yeah. <sighs> Any questions, let me know. I have attached uh, a lot of supplemental materials for this lesson. If you wanted to read it, keep it, um, you know, uh, just as a reference, you could, all right? And then just remember the questions that I have uh, posed. I will not be, you don't have to comment on anything. You don't have to um, send it to me, but at least research on it, all right? Uh, what else? What else am I forgetting to say? No, that's it, all right? Uh, read on the flotation. Watch the video of flotation. I think that's the required once for the supplemental materials and thank you for your patience and understanding and always be safe everyone all right god bless bye the area the gums itself like what is done with us in human dentistry What he's doing is he's trying to burr. Uh, what do you call this? <laughs> Iba'y nasa isip ko ba sinabi kong burr? Uh, <laughs> Na-distract ako siya. Um, the, the, the root fragment, again, is in contact directly with the maxilla. So you're trying to make a separation or break that separation. It's not just periodontal ligament. It's like bone on bone, right? Um, the periodontal ligament there is very tough. So you're trying to burr around the remaining tooth root fragment. Kaya, uh, what do you call this? Uh, you hear that parang crunching sound because you're actually burring the bone already. Since the alveolar socket is quite sclerotic, so it narrowed, so loose na yung fragment, but they cannot pull it out. So what they're gonna do is um, do a transbuchal one and uh, push it to the oral cavity. What, what instrument is that? It's a gelpi. Looks like a terfine. It is a bone drill. The manual bone drill. That's a Steinman pen? A blunt one? Yeah, it's a blunt one. This is what you use for intramedullary painting of fractures. In a, that's a big size for a dog. <laughs> Oh yeah, I know.
there's a two bit moving at all. Oh, yeah, it's, it's rotated and turned. And... We got it. There we go. Let me go back. Oh. All right. His left hand is um, manipulating the pin, right? His right hand is inside the oral cavity of the horse, trying to manipulate that fragment out. Right, so it's a dual uh, thing he's doing. And then, so it's a two bit moving at all. Oh yeah, it's, it's rotated and turned. And... Oh, we got it. There we go. <coughs> That's pretty much all just apical semen You got it. You flush it. That's the dental packing right there. Right? Cool, right? Yeah, very cool. <laughs>